Today, we're going to cut and stack the common rafters that create the roof for the back porch of our spec house. Stack means install. And a common rafter is a rafter that spans the entire distance from the exterior wall, usually a wall, to the ridge, which is usually at the center of the span. Almost all of the wooden I-beams you have seen us install as rafters are technically common rafters. But the rafters we're making today are even more common because they're cut from real lumber and they have a seat cut, which is part of a bird's mouth at the bottom. You're getting a look at the patio here after it's completed because I want you to first get a look at a couple of specific parts. These are the common rafters. They're sitting on a ridge beam. Under the rafters are the ceiling joists. We will also have our same overhang treatment with false rafter tails, bird blocks, and the barge rafter overhang at the gable end. Let's wind the video back, go inside the house, and show you how to cut these things with a framing square. So the plans tell me, and the decision has already been made, that the pitch of this roof is 8 in 12. That means 8 inches of rise and 12 inches of run. To mark that onto the board, you would find the 8 on the tongue or skinny side of the square and put it exactly on the edge of the board. Then you find the 12 on the blade or the wide side of the square and put the 12 on the same, that is on the same side of the square in alignment with the same edge of the board. 12, 8, and mark it. That's the pitch. That is the cut at the top and at the bottom of the rafter. You see the problem with marking this pitch cut? It doesn't go all the way to the edge of the board. That's a hassle. Here's how you deal with that. An 8 in 12 is exactly the same thing as a 16 in 24, which, by the way, is about as big as an ordinary framing square will let you go. But I take the 16 on the tongue and put it on the edge of the board, and the 24 on the blade and put it on the edge of the board, same edge of the square, same edge of the board, and draw all the way across the rafter for a complete pitch cut. That's a way easier thing to draw and to cut in one move than the short distance and then extend it. There is the end of my rafter. That is going to coincide with the center of the top beam. Let's figure the length now. Let's calculate the length of the actual rafters from the back of the seat cut to the center of the top beam. We know that the complete, the overall span is 19 feet 7 inches. You divide that by 2 because the span is the whole distance, but each rafter only has to deal with half that amount. So 19.7 divided by 2 is 9 feet 9 and a half inches. That's the horizontal distance from the outside of the beam to the center of the top beam that each rafter has to deal with. Now we convert the 9.5 inches to decimals of a foot. You do that by dividing 9.5 inches, inches divided by 12 inches per foot equals 0.79. So each rafter is dealing with 9.79 feet. Okay, and now we get out this ancient and honorable tool, framing square. The top table on the rafter tables is length of common rafters per foot of run. These numbers indicate those values at each pitch. In other words, if this was 412 pitch, the length of the common rafter per foot of run would be 12.65. But we have an 812 pitch. So the length of a common rafter on an 812 pitch is 14.42 inches per foot of run. So 9.75 feet times 14.42 inches of rafter length per foot of run equals 141.17 inches. That's the length of the rafter. 0.17 doesn't do us any good. We're using a tape measure. So let's convert 0.17 to fractions. 0.17 times 16, because there's 16 sixteenths per inch, 
equals 2.72 sixteenths of an inch. In other words, just a little less than 3 sixteenths. So the length of our rafter is 141 inches and 3 sixteenths. 141 and 3 sixteenths weak. Or conversely, 141 and 1 eighth strong. Either of those is going to work because I can set the height of my beam wherever I want. Here's what this means. We're going to cut a rafter that is 141 and 3 sixteenths from right here to a point that is exactly above the back of the seat cut. Or conversely, it's 141 and 3 sixteenths from the bottom of the pitch cut at the top to the back of the seat cut at the bottom. 141 and 3 sixteenths is the number from pitch cut to pitch cut. We'll talk about what I'm doing with the tail and we'll talk about the depth of the seat cut later. Picture this as a plumb or vertical cut centered at the top, at the very center of the beam at the top of this roof. So if I come square off of a plumb cut, it will be a level cut. Can you see that? That that line right there will be level and will be sitting directly on one half of the five and a half inch wide beam that will be located at the top. The beam's five and a half inches wide, half of that is two and three quarters, so this vertical cut will be centered on the five and a half inch beam at the top of the world, and this vertical cut will be up against the outside of it. Now for reasons that will become clear, I'm putting the same length seat cut at the bottom. Two and three quarter inches will mean that we have the same stand or distance from the seat cut to the top of the roof, both at the bottom and at the top. That makes, makes the length of the rafter consistent when it comes to rest on the beams and doesn't change or tweak or mess up our calculation when we figure the length of this thing. So I've got two rafters cut out. Either one of them I could use as a pattern and I could just jump right in and gang cut and then you know, finish up the rest of the stack, but I'm not feeling that gutsy. I'm going to go out and I'm going to mock these up. I'm going to put them up on the wall and I'm just going to make sure they fit. Sometimes, you know, if you're not doing this every day and you just are not entirely sure of your process, there's nothing wrong with checking it before you commit yourself to really cutting up a bunch of wood. So this is good. It fits really nice. We'll put our tails on. The roof will stack out real nice. It works great. There's a lot of ways to, to, to lay out and cut a rafter. I mean, there's books and there's tables and there's calculators and there's framing squares. And I like being able to use a framing square. And if you're a carpenter, you dang sure ought to be able to do it with a framing square. When I'm cutting rafters like this, I'm trying to get within, inside of, a sixteenth of an inch of perfect. Now it's easy to be off by a sixteenth of an inch cutting these things, which means at the end of the day, when I've got this little roof system cut out, I can expect the whole bundle of cut rafters to be within an eighth of an inch of one another, worst case scenario, which is okay unless the bottom of the roof is going to be a sheetrocked, vaulted ceiling. In that case, perfect is the goal and any discrepancy must be in the top side of the rafter, not the bottom.
Now aside from cutting the rafters, there's one other cut we need to make as well. And that is for the beam pocket for the ridge beam. This was measured carefully to be exactly halfway between the two exterior beams at the side wall where the tails of the rafters bear. The height was indicated on our plans and we checked those calculations and then cut the pocket. This is another case where a little too short is better than a little too high because you can always shim it up. You're seeing now that I cut all of the rafters before I installed the ridge beam. That was intentional. It's much easier to raise or lower the ridge beam just a little bit in order to get a nice snug fit with the rafters you cut than it is to match the rafters perfectly to an already installed ridge. Now that's not always possible to do it like this. But when I can, the common rafters are cut first and the ridge is installed to fit. Boy, it'd be nice if we could get our lift back here to help hold this beam up, but there's no access at all on the back side of the house, so we're doing it the old-fashioned way. A lot of the fastening that happens when you're stacking a roof are toenails at the wall line, at the beams at the edge. That means shooting a nail at an angle to secure two pieces together. Now, toenails are not near as strong when they're not placed properly. So pay attention, place your shot, and typically two from one side and one from the other. As a general rule, the toenail should go in at about a 45 degree angle, with half of the length of the nail through the rafter and half of the length of the nail into the beam or the wall. Now toenailing can be effective with a shorter nail than standard through nailing, but in general, a 16 penny nail is the right thing to use in framing a roof. It's ideal in almost every situation. And in addition to the nails, there are special hangers and clips that will fasten rafters to beams and walls in a hurricane-proof way. And your plans may call for something like that. It's certainly never a bad idea to make something strong. Now I'm putting these ridge blocks up here for two reasons. To keep the rafters from rolling over and to make sure they're right on layout. I probably made this plenty clear earlier, but I'm going to mention it again here. It's really important to be careful about hitting your layout with your rafters. It's easy for beginners to think, what's the big deal? Nobody's going to see this anyway, and it's not like the roof is going to fall down if this thing is a half an inch off layout. And you're right, but when you come back to sheet this, when you're throwing the plywood or the OSB down, if one of these rafters is off by a significant amount, it really complicates your life. Now you got to cut the sheets on the roof and get sawdust where you're walking or on the ground and pass it up. There's a, it's a special cut so there's more waste. It's just a headache. When the rafters are right on layout, you can just slam the sheets down. The edges line up, the nailing is good, and you get through the job much quicker. But if you do mess up the layout and get several rafters in the wrong spot before you realize it, sometimes it's a lot less work to just fight the roof sheeting a little bit through that one segment, that one area, than it is to stop, tear out, and relocate several rafters. This porch is going to get a ceiling. I'm not exactly sure what the finished surface is going to be. I'm not even quite sure what the elevation of the ceiling is going to be, but it's going to make everything on the bottom side of this roof diaphragm invisible. It's going to go away. But what is not invisible is the overhangs. Just like the rest of this house, we're going to have the false tails on the, on the eave that has to, has to be put on, you've seen that happen, and we have the overhang on the gable end, the barge rafters, with everything that is implied about getting that car decking in there at the right elevation and matching, you've seen all that. So these last rafters have been lowered, uh, the seat cut has been deepened, so the top of the rafter comes down. It's a similar problem to the ones that we've solved on these other gable ends, just a slightly different solution. So I believe that any, pretty much any homeowner, anybody with an interest in building something, anybody that has worked with their hands even a little bit, could do a project like this. 
And about nine times out of 10, if the do-it-yourselfer is careful and will take, and as patient, and will take the time to do some rework if he has to, he can get a, pro a product that in many cases is nicer than the product that a professional may get. The big difference is that the pro is going to get it done a lot faster and he won't waste the material and he'll be, I mean, it happens, it appears to happen more effortlessly as a function of how many times you've done something like that before. Now, it's not necessarily effortless, but that's the way it looks from the outside. I mean, everything's easy once you know how, right? There's another variability, though, that has to be mentioned, and that is that a pro many times is comfortable taking risks and being up off the ground, perhaps in ways that are not all that smart, right? Or perhaps there's a type of a numbness that gets built in over time, and it's easy to overestimate your own capabilities. I get that. And so if you are thinking of doing something like this, don't back off, just be careful and be patient and set aside, I don't know, maybe four times as much time as you think it's going to take and be, be able to kind of get into enjoying the process instead of being in a hurry to enjoy the outcome. So if you have just stumbled into this little video of me sitting up here talking about this roof system, Maybe you haven't recognized yet that we have a whole series associated with this. This is one episode in a series of building an entire house. There's a house sitting right over there that you probably can't see on the screen, and we've built every square inch of it, and we've prepared the grade, and we've made, we've made a series out of it because, here's the reason, is because it has become apparent to me after 40 years in this business that not a lot of people get to see this process from the beginning to the end. Even some tradesmen. I mean, think of an electrician or a plumber. They show up when it's time for their craft and they leave when, they're, when their rough end work is done. And then they come back to put the top out, you know, to put the fixtures and the switch plates in and they see that little window of time and then they're gone. And so in many cases, even a construction specialist hasn't seen the whole process. And we thought that perhaps there would be some value in bringing that to YouTube and maybe there is. You see this post right here? I had to cut it twice, and I flatter myself that I'm a pro. That happens to everybody, even the people that put a set of bags on every single day. In fact, dare I admit it, this is a fourth time in this project that I've put a structural member in, or in the first case, a pony wall, and forgot to subtract the thickness or the height or the depth of what was going to sit on top of it. I, I guess this may be early onset something, but I forget what you call that. So anyway, don't be afraid to try it, don't be afraid to re do some rework, and don't be afraid to enjoy the process. And for those of you who are regular viewers of this series, it seems clear to us that the reason people are finding this is because you're telling them. Thank you for your interest and thank you for sharing it with your friends and coworkers. You're going to be seeing these aluminum bridges or bridge planks as they're called around here a lot as we work around the exterior of this house. They are so handy. One is 20 feet long and 12 inches wide. The other is 24 feet long and 16 inches wide. They're kind of heavy. They're unwieldy to move around, but boy, once they're in place, they allow us to create a very stable and a long work platform in a short amount of time. You don't always need a full scaffolding setup in order to get the work done. A lot of times you just need a place to stand. Trying to do this job on a ladder would be slow and risky since there's no good stable level ground to set it on and since I need to move back and forth a lot. So although it takes some time to build shoring and platforms like this, it's almost always worth the time and effort. Plus it is safer by a wide margin. 
Ladders are very dangerous tools, and honestly, I try and avoid using them as much as I can. Now, for one or two items, a ladder will make you money. But after that, after just one or two uh, repeat performances, you ought to build a platform. And regarding platforms, there's a common saying on framing job sites. Never walk on anything that you did not build yourself. This is good advice. Don't make assumptions about things that could have a real negative impact on your own safety and well-being if your assumption doesn't quite pan out. Even though these are the same sort of false tales that we've put in other places on the house, these are installed a little differently. On these, I cut a bird's mouth right into the 3x8 so that the top of the rafter is an inch and a half above the top of the tail. That way, the top plane of the tongue and groove decking at the overhang and the top plane of the rafters, the common rafters, are flush. There's the same height and the sheeting can cover it all up uniformly. Up against, yeah, like that. Putting these vents in here was a little bit optional since the air temperatures on this porch above and below the roof will always be pretty much the same. So condensation will be at an absolute minimum in the attic and ventilation is not as important, but vented eave blocks on this house are a big design element, and I figured it would look silly not to have them. And if anybody ever does decide to enclose and heat this porch, turn it into living space, it would be miserable to put these vent blocks in later. Besides, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Part of the engineering that Dave Thomas provided is to install drag struts, that is, Simpson straps that tie from the roof diaphragm back into and tying to the floor diaphragm, the second floor diaphragm. What that does is tie the two edges of this roof to the house in a really, really bulletproof way. And man, I gotta tell you, it really stiffened this whole thing up. The rest of this patio is fairly routine carpenter work, which you have seen a lot of, so we won't do a whole lot of extra explanation. As you can see, there's a little bit of space inside this roof that will be accessible for storage. We'll probably put an attic access panel in there. This would be a good place for Christmas lights and outdoor decorations. Maybe complete with a pull-down stairway, haven't decided on that yet. And in case you haven't stumbled into it, I hope you check out our podcast. We cover all sorts of topics there, including topics related to the spec house. It's a fact of my life that I forget a lot of the questions in the comments, and we found that the podcast is a good place to go back, look them over, remember the ones that recur, and discuss and answer some of those in detail. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work.